Good evening, everybody. It's time for us to get started. You all hear me? It's time for us to get started tonight. We're a little slim, but that's okay. I figured there'd be a lot of people out on account of the storms and stuff, but uh, maybe uh, they'll pass on over and won't uh, interfere with us a whole lot. So, But anyway, thank you for coming and being here, and you're always welcome. we got some visitors. I don't call them visitors anymore, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, we're glad to have them with us tonight, and we all, we're all always glad to have people to stop in and come by and see us and be with us, but I've uh, got a few announcements I want to make before we get started. Uh, David will be leading her singing tonight, and I'll do the first prayer, and then Lance will have our closing prayer. Robert Evans got a good report, in a way, on his... Uh, test, but he's got to go back and do a CT scan. Robert, they ever set that up? It's coming Monday? Okay. We hope everything works out good with that and everything turns out okay, and I think it will. Karen Moore, this is sister of Debbie Windsor, is waiting for results on a, a scan that she's supposed to be having, and she, she hasn't had that. April the 19th. I don't write it down, I'll forget it. Then half time I forget it. Charles Cadelka, he was going for a test. He had it today. And uh, uh, Medina, what was it you said about that? He, everything looked good? Great. Yeah, good. I know they were worried about that. So, But anyway, Brenda Abernathy's not having... Uh, very many good days. She's got bad knees and can't get up and down. And Oliver's not well either. So please keep them in your prayers. And uh, Miss Helen Hayes is not doing too good either. We need to keep Miss Helen in her prayers. And uh, she's having some bad days too. And uh, of course she's about middle aged, so you know. But uh, need to keep Miss Helen in her prayers. Mitch Rollins' dad, and most of y'all know that he passed away, and uh, his funeral was last Thursday. And Cheryl Ellis is back with us Sunday. She had uh, carpal tunnel, and now she's going to have to have it on the other arm, too. So, uh, And then uh, Juanita Lawrence is going to have to have a rotary, rotary cup surgery April the 19th. That's uh, the same day that uh, uh, Miss, Miss Karen's going to have her test. April the 19th. Belle DeWalt, his uh, girlfriend's sister, is having a lot of trouble with blood pressure, high blood pressure, so we need to keep her in a prayer. Her name is Chantel something. I can't make out my own writing here, but uh, that's her name. And uh, I don't say Chuck, but doing good. And Bill Pollock is back home at his regular place of stay. Mike went to see him. <laughs> Mike went to see him this week. It's kind of coincidental. He he went up to the room that he thought he was in, and Mr. Polly wasn't there, but his brother was in there. <laughs> so he got to see his brother, and then he turned around, and went over to the nursing home, and seen Mr. Polly. And he said he was in real good spirits and uh, was sitting and eating and stuff. And he had to he had to lead a new song with him. Mr. Polly always wants to lead a song, and this time it was Silent Night. <laughs> So uh, I don't think Mike knew that song, but <laughs> but anyway, uh, he always wants to sing a song when you go to see him. Does anybody else have any any uh, news or? Uh, my wife, she went to the doctor today, and uh, he said she had about 25 pounds of fluid on her. And they're trying to come up with something to give her to get that fluid off. They gave her something. They called her back later on today, told her not to take it because all of her enzymes was bottomed out and her potassium was bottomed out. So they can't give her that because it'll pull her potassium down lower. So she's got to go back tomorrow and have more blood work and stuff done to see if they can figure out what's uh, what they can do to help her get this fluid off of her. Uh, the next youth night will be April the 15th at 6 p.m. April the 21st will be our adult game night. 
and then singles to meet March, oh, well, that's in nowhere, April the 28th at 6 p.m. Does anybody else have any any good news or bad news? All right, bow with me. Let's have a word of prayer. Brother Mike's going to be in Ecclesiastes again tonight, so bow with me. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thank thankful for this day. We thank you for our health, the ability we have to come here to study your word. We pray that you'll open our heart and ears, help us to remember what we hear and study here, that we can be better <coughs> servants to you. Father, pray that you'll be with all like these I just mentioned this sick, those who are going in for tests, those who have had surgeries and are going for more surgeries. We pray that your blessings be upon them. Be with those who are in the nursing homes, that they'll be comforted as we try to go visit them. And we thank you, Father, for the uh, motivation that we have to check on these people who are in nursing homes and see about them and uh, try to encourage them as much as we can. Pray that you be with Brother Mike tonight as he brings us a lesson. And we know, Father, that we sin often, and we pray for forgiveness of that sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
who was praying for rain, but you can stop. I think we've had enough for right now. It was raining very, very hard when I left Gallatin, and I happened to have a radar app on my phone, and at a stoplight, I pulled it up just to see where it was, and it just looked like a whole line of storms just cutting like a knife, just right up through our area. And so I don't know how much longer it's going to be with us, but uh, we're safe tonight. I know that several people stayed home today, uh, used good common sense to stay out of this weather. Not everybody drives well at night or in, in uh, rainy weather, and uh, we're thankful and grateful. I'm grateful to the elders here for providing the streaming ability so that we can have people at home to, to watch us and take part of this. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful that we have that as an opportunity remain connected. It's still best if we're here together, especially on the Lord's Day, especially when we come together to worship, but I am so grateful uh, for all of those good benefits. Last week in chapter 9, <clears throat> one of my favorite parts of Ecclesiastes, uh, we, we talked about this, and I'm just going to get a, a little bit of an overview here, uh, beginning in verse 10 of chapter 9. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it <clears throat> with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. That's good advice on its face, and it's good advice spiritually as well. The things that we have to do, let's make sure that we do them here, that we can take care of what needs to be done first while we still have the abilities to do it and the resources. Secondly, while we still have our days with us, because uh, at one point we're going to wake up one day, and, and that's going to be the last time that we get to wake up. And so... We need to make sure that we do these things as we're able to do them. Don't put things off. Anybody here a procrastinator or know a procrastinator? If you know a procrastinator, let me see your hands. Okay. I tend not to be a procrastinator, you know, generally speaking. If I've got something to do, I want to do it, do it, get it off my books, get it out of the way, and not have to fool with it anymore. Carla will tell you sometimes if I get a bill in the mail, I go back to the office and I write out the check for it and I put a stamp on it and, and if I've got a mind to do it, I'll go right back out and put it in the mailbox uh, or even take it to the post office just so I know that there's no, uh, no, no delay on that. I want to take care of it, be done with it, and if there's something that becomes overdue later, Carla and anybody else that knows me would say, well, that's not in his character to procrastinate, to put something like that off. Now, that's not the case with everything I do. There are things that I put off, but that's a different story, and you're not going to hear that. <clears throat> so verses 11 and 12 now of chapter 9. I returned and saw under the sun, and that expression under the sun just means globally, right, just of, of all things that we see, that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. This year in the, in the uh, Final Four, uh, as I understand it, this is the first time ever that the NCAA Basketball Final Four has taken place without a single number one seed playing in the Final Four games. Uh, I think there, were, uh, there was a number four, two number fives, and a number nine that were playing. Very unusual to get that arrangement, but as you would see the favorites lose in these games early on, you think, well, why didn't the better team win? Well, the better team did that night. But here again, what, what Solomon's saying, the race is not to the swift, the battle is not to the strong. Time and chance is going to happen to everybody. That shot that that kid hit a thousand times in practice and he misses it when it counts, time and chance happen to us all. For man does also not know his time, like a fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time, when it falls suddenly upon them. And so here again, the admonition to us is to realize that it's not all within our control, the elements that are around us, not even the time that we have. So let's do the best we can all the time when the opportunities present themselves, but realize that just in an instant, in a moment, uh, we could lose this race, lose that battle, have other disadvantages, or even have our life to end not because of what we've done, but just simply because time and chance happens to us all. All right, so in chapter 10, let's look at the first four verses here as we look at the uh, foolishness in regard to influence. Dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor, and 
and so does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. And even when a fool walks among, uh, along the way, he lacks wisdom, and he shows everyone that he is a fool. If the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post, uh, for conciliation pacifies great offenses. So what's on the board right now, a continuation of the thoughts from chapter 9. Remember these chapters were added centuries after the Bible was written. Even a small amount of folly or foolishness can devalue wisdom and honor. And I like a good joke. I, I like, you know, humor, and I like to cut up from time to time. Uh, recently I've been hearing some, some jokes on, uh, um, on, on uh, Chuck Norris. Everybody remember Chuck Norris, who he is? And they make these little jokes about Chuck Norris because he's just indestructible. And uh, sometimes you get hooked into this and you just keep hearing it. And, well, that's funny for the moment, but now if there's a serious situation or if we're talking about something that's really pertinent to, to this issue at hand, and if somebody comes in with foolishness, it's going to devalue what's going on. I've known some leaders in the church before, not here, but some leaders in the church before who uh, were so reliant on humor that they would try to interject humor into everything because that was their crutch and that's what they did. And it undercut the wisdom. It undercut the moment of what should have been going on. In verse 2, contrasting right and left, the right has been seen as the good, logical, and strong, while the left has represented evil, illogical, and weak. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but his fool's heart is at its left. That's not to say that when we say right or left today that it has the same connotation. Remember, the Bible says that we're not supposed to go in the right ditch or the what? Left ditch. Stay out of the ditches. Stay out of the extremes and stay on what God says to do. And uh, verse 3, everyone can see the deficiencies of a foolish person. Now, I'm not going to ask for any uh, examples of who you think are foolish people because all of us could say uh, any number of examples today. Uh, and I'm not you know, even, well, you could say politics, entertainment, and in uh, athletics. You could say in the church sometimes. Uh, there are all kinds of examples of people who are going to act foolish. Even when a fool walks along the way, he lacks wisdom, and he shows everyone that he is a fool. Uh, years ago, I had some difficulty in pronouncing things that I had not heard first. I don't know if you have that problem or not, but you might look at a word, and if I hear it first and then see it written down, I'm good. Melchizedek, I, I'm good on that. Uh, there are some other words like that. I'm good on that. But there were some words that I stumbled over. I just wasn't able to compute properly in my mind and be able to take those letters and figure out how they should sound. And sometimes I would say a word incorrectly. I don't mean the word incorrectly. I mean I would say a word and say it wrong. And, uh, and those moments would stick with me. And uh, so if you've ever known, now that was just my learning deficiency on that particular issue. And, and I've learned since then. I've got a, a neat little app on my phone called Bible Pronunciations. And I can pull up any word that's in the Bible, any name, uh, a town or a person's name, and it will, it will sound it out for me. It will say Melchizedek or whatever it is. Uh, but that's not to say that I'm still going to stumble from time to time. But there are some times that people in their speech may show their ignorance or their foolishness in a situation. And, uh, and so that's self-evident. And, and here he's talking about a fool walking along his way, and everybody knows that he's a fool in that sense. Now let me pause there for a moment. What do you think about using the term fool? Generally speaking, or as far as what the Bible does with it? Right, right. Different words depict that. It's, it's kind of... Well, Jesus used the word as well, you know, talking about you fool and, and th those types of situations. And so in some senses, we, we might have, uh, like there are a couple of words that, uh, uh, one word parents don't like their kids to use a lot, and that's stupid, okay? 
and another word uh, that's a and, and they're per perfectly fine words it's just the way that we use them another word is ignorant what's the difference in ignorant and stupid what's that ignorant is unlearned okay so you can fix ignorant you know in a sense right you can fix if you don't know I can teach you if you're not teachable or if you're not willing to learn then that may put you in this other category and the fool that walks along his way is going to be in that category really of, of not wanting to be taught not wanting to learn those things stupid that's right that's right uh, I'm not your mother or father so I'm not going to call you down on that but that's that's what that is Well, I, I would say that, yes, some people are overachievers, and they may have ignorance and stupidity uh, both together in a package deal, um, and, they, and they drive the vehicles as well. Um, uh, if the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post, for conciliation pacifies great offenses. Okay? Um, people do lose their tempers from time to time, as Lance just mentioned. Right around in Mount Juliet, and you'll find some people on, on the road that uh, if they haven't lost their temper yet, they're looking to, and so you're kind of looking for those opportunities for them. I had, uh, when was I coming down? I was coming down yesterday for ladies' Bible class, coming down Lebanon Road, and, uh, and I was on, on the two-lane section of Lebanon Road, and this car back behind me just couldn't stand to be behind me because he must have sensed that uh, there was somebody that was 60 years old driving, I guess. I don't know what his problem was. Uh, but we come up to a little wider space in the road. He passes me on the shoulder and then comes back in. with. He had a nice muscle car and stuff and, and just went the le next two miles right in front of me. Like, I don't know what you gained by that. I mean, I barely had enough room in front of me for him to come in. But for some reason, he wasn't going to stay behind me. So he acted a little foolishly in that sense off on the shoulder and back on to really no gain at all. Uh, so sometimes people are just going to act foolishly. Uh, you take a you take a uh, 18 or 19 year old that goes out and uh, peels off rubber on his on his tires, and what are we that are 40, 50, and 60 going to think about that? Well, it, show off, yeah, yeah. It doesn't do a whole lot when you think, well, that, that was about 8,000 miles worth of your tires you just, you just peeled off there, you know. If you if you've saved up your money and you bought a set of tires and you put $1,000 of them on your car, you're not going to peel out in the parking lot. Uh, you're going to find another way to impress that girl or whoever you're with. Uh, you're not going to do something like that. Pardon me? That's the, way, the reason you rotate them. <laughs> Well, in, in some cases it might be, well, anyway. Uh, we, we need the right attitude uh, to, to calm a person down who might lose, uh, their, uh, lose their temper. Verses 5 through 7. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun. There's that phrase under the sun as well. An error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in great uh, dignity while the, ruler, uh, while the rich sit in lowly place. I have seen servants on horses while princes walk on the grounds like servants. So here's another universal truth. The foolish are in the places of authority while those who should rule are ignored. Well, in our country, we have ways of putting people into leadership positions, you know, through voting and politics and then our other organizations. We, you know, determine who's going to lead the church and who's going to lead, you know, our homeowners association and other places like that. We may not always agree, but here he's saying, here's another universal truth. It's not always the best and the brightest that are leading us uh, in, in these areas. The foolish are in places of authority, while those who should be ruling are ignored. And this evil comes from a ruler. And so, um, and I've got here that nepotism contributes to this at times. Anybody, uh, can you tell me what nepotism is? Okay, it's a favoritism to someone in your inner circle. Nepotism, usually a relative. And so you take somebody who may or may not be qualified and you elevate them or place them in a, in a position of authority when they really you know, wouldn't be the ideal person to put in that. And so sometimes that's what happens. We put people who are beyond their competence in an area uh, where they don't feel comfortable or don't feel um, they're not adequately trained to do that, and it brings harm to all of us in that sense. So. So he says, he says that this is a universal truth, 
and I, I believe that it is. Verses 8 through 11 now. He who digs a pit will fall into it. Now, there's probably a lot of us that have done that from time to time. We've dug a hole of some sort, and we might <clears throat> stumble back into it or have a thing. It's a little deeper issue than that. And whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits wood may be endangered by it. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. So let's go through a few of these now, verses 8 and 9. Four different scenarios are listed where things may turn bad. A person who digs a pit may fall into it. Um, many of us as husbands and as uh, home improvement guys uh, may have gotten ourselves in over our head from time to time in a project. Uh, I once remodeled a basement in Mayfield, Kentucky, and there were 56 sheets of, of uh, drywall that I put up in that basement. And I did it all by myself. And there were many times as I'm hoisting those big sheets of plywood to put on the wall, I'm thinking, what am I doing? And why did I turn down any help? But I wanted to do it by myself. I also did all the mud work on it, which I'm not a, a mud person. I can't put on the compound very well, uh, which was evidenced by the fact that I had to hire two fellows to come in. Town. Otherwise, it was just a big blob. Jerry, are you, are you volunteering to help me with drywall? Oh, okay, I, I didn't know. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, the, these scenarios, um, and uh, there, there's some deeper stories behind that, but it could be taken literally or figuratively. You know, you uh, dig a hole and fall into it, break through a wall and a serpent to bite you. Um, um, Anybody seen any snakes out yet this year? You have, Joe? What, what kind of snake was it? A live one? A oh, rat snake, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If it's a live one, that's all I want to know. Yeah, I, I just want to know. Yeah, okay. I hear it's illegal to kill a snake in Tennessee. Is that right? No, it's not? Okay. Yeah. I c huh? Yeah, well, I tell you what, I'm not much in favor of them. You know, they 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 they, they got a bad rap in the Bible, and I you know I I'm I'm just kind of anti-snake on that. But uh, but these types of things. So four different scenarios, right? Person digs a hole or digs a pit may fall into it. Uh, person who tears down a wall may be bitten by a serpent. Uh, think about that. Dig a pit and fall into it. All right. Who is it back in the book of Esther? that went about to do all this evil and it got turned and used against him. You remember who that was? Haman. Haman, that's right. Okay, so he had all this schemed out in his mind and it ended up he was the one uh, that was hanged on that gallows. And so as you go through life, there's some things, right? I've seen some people before where they're wanting to do harm to somebody else and they end up doing some harm uh, to themselves. Uh, one video I've seen in the past, um, the, these kids are running in a race and this one kid's a little stocky, so I felt uh, an affinity towards him. You know, he's winning the race, and he's got a little gut on him, and he's doing so well. But then he turns just slightly to point his finger at who he was beating, and then he got tripped up and fell down and didn't, didn't finish the race, okay? And so through all these scenarios, you can see, look, sometimes, sometimes what you intend for others may come back on you. Number three, person who quarries stone may be hurt by the stones that fall on or a person who splits wood may be endangered uh, so evil intent on the first couple there uh, dig, dig a pit and break through a wall you're talking about breaking into a house there or going into someone else's area you know we've got a lot of odd rules in our country from time to time uh, if you've got to defend your uh, ground type type rule Somebody break into your house, you have the right to defend yourself with appropriate means. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can set a booby trap to where it cuts a person's leg off if they break through your window and, and crawl into your, your house. But here's the thing. You break through a wall and a serpent might bite you. So here again, evil intent. Um, let's see, the, the next verse here was verse 10. If an ax is dull one does not sharpen, and one does not sharpen the edge, then he w must use more strength. 
uh, Lincoln commented on this once, talking about how he would go about to cut down a tree. And I forget the specifics of it, but he would, he said, anyway, if you, if you give me an hour to cut down the tree, I'm going to use 50 minutes to sharpen the axe. In other words, he understood, use the right tool, but use it the right way. If you've ever tried to use a dull axe to do anything for cutting, you know that it's just a, a, it's a, a foolish endeavor for that. Uh, also, in verse 11 then, we're going through verse 11. A serpent may bite when it is not charmed, and the babbler is no different. Uh, the babbler here would be the master of the tongue. Master of the tongue. So we, we need to use our wisdom and talents in a timely fashion, or we may suffer consequences. Um, anybody here tried to charm a snake before? Serpent may bite when it's not charmed. Richard, you ever charmed a snake? No? <laughs> I was holding a meeting in Hohenwald, Tennessee. Anybody been to Hohenwald? Good people in Hohenwald. I, I enjoyed that meeting. And uh, so anyway, it was in the spring and and huh? Hornwald. Hole in the hole in the wall, yeah. So anyway, one day one day I decided uh, I want to get out and uh, and enjoy some of the some of the scenes and so I went up on the Natchez Trace and drove for a while and uh, there was a little place off to the side of the road where there's a walking trail. I thought that's that's what I need to do. I'm gonna go on that walking trail. And so I think it was called the Devil's Triangle or something like that. About three mile three mile circular circular track. So I parked there in this parking lot. No other cars are in the parking lot. Nobody else around. Cell coverage is kind of bad. Here I go just traipsing off on this trail and I'm doing just fine. I get about a mile into that trail and and I walked over something. I thought, well that was an odd looking stick. And I looked back and it was a rattlesnake. And it's about three feet long or so. Just laying there right over the trail. Just sunning itself. And I thought, hmm. What should I do? Well, it was between me and the car, but I hadn't gone but about a mile out of the three miles. And I thought, well, I need to get on the other side of it. It wasn't moving, so I got on the other side of it. And I thought, hmm. Now, if I tell this story without taking a picture, nobody's going to believe me. So I thought, well, I need to take a picture of it. So I took a picture of it. Still hadn't moved. And then I thought, well, now somebody's going to say, yeah, you've got proof that you've got a picture of a rattlesnake but it was probably dead, frozen to death, and you just were there, and there's no glory in taking a picture of a dead snake. So I thought, well, I need to wake this sucker up. <laughs> I'm smarter than you think I am. I did not. <laughs> now, I stayed away. You know, that, that camera on my phone has a zoom, so I don't have to be too close to it. I thought, well, here's a little rock. I'll just roll a rock to it. It'll hit the side of it, and then I'll see it wake up. Of course, I had my video going this time because I want it to go. First rock, I'm nervous. It bounces right over the snake. Doesn't even touch the snake. I didn't go get that rock back. I took a different rock. But this time I rolled that rock and it hit the side of that snake. Boy, that tail came up and it started rattling. And I took my five seconds of video and I was out of there. <laughs> uh, I made it back to my car faster than I made it back to that snake, you know, in the first place. But, you know, there's something that happens to you when you're out in the middle of nowhere with not much cell coverage. There's nobody else at that place because you're the only car there, and you come, and you've come that close to a live rattlesnake. I don't like snakes. I don't like those situations. I wasn't about to charm him or do anything with it. You know, in Texas, they do those rattlesnake roundups. They go out there and get them, and then you can go to a big pavilion, and they'll be handling those snakes all over the place. I am not going to that place. I am not going to that place at all. Let's look at verses 12 through 14. Foolishness in regards to worth. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a, of a fool shall swallow him up. The words of his mouth begin with foolishness, and the end of his talk is like raving madness. A fool also multiplies words, and no man knows what is to be. Who can tell what will be after him? So we have these uh, gracious words or things that are good. In Hebrew, it means favor or grace or elegance. Okay? Have you ever known someone that just knows the right things to say at the right times? 
My dad was like that, especially at funerals. My dad just knew the right things to say about everyone that he was uh, giving a, a service for. He just always knew the right things to put together. And, and those wise, wise words are also very, very beneficial. You know, people don't understand the pressure that you put on a preacher to, to preach a funeral because sometimes people aren't very good. You know, I've had a few people that I've done funerals for, and I knew that they weren't very good. Uh, maybe they didn't uh, love God or know God or obey God at all, and, and the best you could do there is just give some uh, words of comfort to the family and talk good about the person as much as you can. There's a story told of a preacher, though, in a place, and there were a couple of guys, that, and they were notorious for being really, really evil. This is a preacher's story. You remember that? So these two are, are notorious for being very, very evil guys. I mean, everything they did was despicable. And, and one of the brothers died. And so he came to the preacher, and he said, I want you to preach my brother's funeral. He said, I don't think I'll be able to do that. So he was despicable. He was a womanizer. He was a drunk. He cheated people out of money. He did all these things. He said, I want you to do his funeral, and I'm going to pay you $1,000, and I want you to say that he was a saint. And the preacher thought about it for a while. He says, I'll do it. Now, before you think this preacher's greedy, he's, he's, he's kind of conniving. And so he got up during the funeral, and he said, here lies the body of this fellow, and he was a scoundrel, and everybody in the, in, the, in the town knows it. He was a womanizer. He was a drunk. He was a cheat. He cheated people in business. He did all kinds of things. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> you got to pick the words. Those were gracious words, see? Uh, he collected his thousand dollars. Yeah, the fool's lips will cause problems. He will talk too much, showcase his ignorance, and it fails to see that his words only make things worse. When I teach uh, on grief recovery, uh, one of the things that we cover is how we intend to say something that's good and helpful, but it's not always good and helpful. Uh, for example, if you go to visit somebody in the hospital who has a particular disease, don't go in there and say, oh, my uncle had that disease, and he died with it, okay? It may be true, but it's not helpful. Uh, and, and there are so many other things that we can say sometimes when we haven't been in that position, we don't know what the real helpful expectations are, and our foolishness will shine through. And again, we can be foolish in the way that we uh, carelessly use words in communication. We can be foolish also in an ignorant way that we just don't know. We just don't know. For example, uh, a couple loses an infant uh, that's stillborn uh, or miscarriage or you have some other loss. And if you've not experienced those losses in your life, you may be tempted to go and tell them, you know, hey, y'all are still young. You can have more children. You think that's a true statement? Yes, it's usually true. Is it helpful? No, never helpful because they've lost that child. And so there's a difference in how we use our words. And you can say the true things, just like in those examples. And there are also things that we can say to one another that are absolutely true, and yet it's a foolish thing to say those in that way or in that setting. And so we have to be careful. In, in Galatians chapter 6, verses uh, 1 and 2, for example, it says, Brethren, if, if anyone is overtaken in a trespass, a fall, a sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness or gentleness, watching also for yourself lest you be tempted. So in that setting, what Paul's telling the churches there in Galatia is, listen, there's a time that we're going to see somebody that's caught up in a sin. But when you go to help rescue them, and that's the goal is to rescue them out of that sin, one, make sure that you're spiritual, make sure that you're right with God, Go back to Matthew 7, 1, where Jesus says, take the beam out of your eye first, then you can help someone else. Make sure that you're spiritual, first of all. Secondly, make sure that your attitude is proper, that you're doing things in a spirit of gentleness or meekness, and that's what's going to help in that way. So many times we find that, that we don't use words properly, and we may say something that's true, and yet it not be helpful. And, and on that way, uh, let me just throw in this word about gossip gossip anybody heard any good gossip lately would you say that most gossip is true or false which do you think true raise your hand if you think most gossip is true 
Raise it if you think that most gossip is false. You know, most of the gossip is all true. It just should never be repeated. There are things that ought to be kept to ourselves or said to the specific person who's involved instead of talking about them and doing things that are related with gossip. All right, let's look at 15 through 20 as we wrap up tonight. The labor of fools wearies them, for they do not even know how to go to the city. Even the simple tasks are difficult for those who are foolish. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, uh, when, you're no, when your king is the son of nobles and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and for not, not for drunkenness. So a woe is given to the land for two reasons. The king is a lad or inexperienced, and also the princes feast in the morning instead of working first. All right, so that's the woe uh, because they're putting their own pleasures ahead of the work that needs to be done. A blessing is given to the land for two reasons. The king is of nobility, so he knows what he should be doing. He's experienced, has a good lineage of others to teach him and to train him, and also the princes eat at proper time, taking care of business first. So there's a lot that we can learn about what the proper time of things would be. Uh, who was it that was bathing on top of her house and caused someone to lust and desire her? Bathsheba. Who was it that did the, the lusting? David. Where should, yeah, Solomon's father. Where should David have been instead of looking out his palace? He should have been at battle with, the king should have been in his springtime. He should have been with his troops, but he wasn't in the right place at the right time. So there's a lot of wisdom here. Let's go on with verses uh, 18 through 20. Because of laziness, the building decays, and through the idleness of hands, the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. Well, let's look at verse 18 now. Laziness causes decline and destruction. When the storms came through a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks back, we had some roof damage at, at the place where we're renting. It's part of a, uh, of a 55 plus community, and there are four plexes, four houses all stuck together. And so there were a number of shingles that had come off the house and landed in our little courtyard. So I could see where the shingles were missing. I made a call immediately to the people we rented from to let them know. Made another call the next week. Still haven't seen anybody come out to take care of those missing shingles. Now what's going to happen over time if there's a hole that allows water to come in like today? What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, we're going to have some damage. It's going to get up in the attic, come down. Eventually there's going to be other water to come. Now what should have been done if it was my house, I would have gotten up there before the storm was over and uh, try to find out exactly where those things are and find somebody to come patch that and do that, that in the proper way. A job not well done or not completed will suffer. And uh, verse 19, a summary of the fool's words and deeds uh, are met there. Number 20 now, our last verse for tonight. Do not curse the king in your thought. Do not curse the rich even in your bedroom. For a bird of the air may carry your voice and a bird in flight will tell the matter. <laughs> all right, we all have opinions. And sometimes we share them when we shouldn't. And that, that happens to all of us. What do you think Solomon's trying to say here about do not curse you, your king even in your thought, for a bird of the air may carry your voice? I've got some of it up on the screen. Kind of goes back with gossip, doesn't it? Well, where'd you hear that? Oh, a little bird told me. Lord, little bird told me. I don't know the etymology of that phrase. It may come back to this verse. You know, many things that we have experienced in our life come out of the Bible. But here's a good example. You know, be careful. Even in your thoughts, even in your thoughts, even in your bedroom, be careful about what you think because all those things uh, will erode the wisdom and you don't want to be like the foolish man who on his way to town where he can't even find his way to town. Along the way, everyone knows that he's a fool because of the way that he does his things. All right, any questions about what we've covered uh, for tonight? Okay. So, uh, should we curse the king or not? No. What about in the privacy of our bedrooms? No. Okay. 
keep the birds away. That's right. We don't need any little birdies coming around telling things. <clears throat> on, on that point, just real quick, when these little birds come around and talk, they're rarely named. Have you ever noticed that? Well, how would you hear that? Oh, somebody told me. Who was it? Oh, I'm not going to say. Then you ought not to repeat any of it. Matter of fact, here's a good thing. When somebody starts to share something with you about another person, why don't you just stop them and say, should you really be sharing that with me? or should you express your thoughts to that person directly? Go back in the Bible and look at a few things. We're going to have some lessons on this in the next few weeks about how we take care of issues that come up between uh, individuals in the church and outside the church, and go back and look at some of these things. And I, I dare say you're going to find a pretty straightforward path that Jesus has for us. Go to Matthew 5 and Matthew 18, those two passages there. Matthew 5, 30, 32, somewhere in there, talks about if we've done something wrong against another person, reconcile with that person before we come worship. Matthew 18, if somebody's done something against us, go to that person, and between you and that person alone, tell that matter before them. There are a lot of things in the Bible that we just kind of find inconvenient at times to follow. So be careful, and that's a good one to stick on tonight. Don't curse the king. Don't curse the king. And you might think, well, I'm glad we don't have a king. We just have a president. <laughs> Apply it the way you want to. Okay, I'm not getting political. But be careful what we do. That's what, that's what Solomon's talking about. David has a song of encouragement that's been selected for us tonight. I really appreciate each of you coming out tonight, and we hope and pray for good weather and good driving safety uh, to our homes tonight. Let's stand and sing during the song.